So welcome everybody to this week's Macklin's Take with me, Andy Clark and Matt Macklin. Hope everybody is well. And today we're embarking on another deep dive. We've had a lot of fun with these since we started doing them in autumn last year. But today's is a little bit different because up until this point, we've centred in on fights that we remember that we were around for, that we watched. Uh, a couple of them, Matt was there uh, and speaking to people who were also there in attendance at, at ringside on the night. So there's been a lot more kind of familiarity to them. This one is not in that category. This is our first historic deep dive, if you like. And when you talk about big fights, they don't come any bigger than this one. This was literally billed as the fight of the century back on March the 8th, 1970. There's been a lot written and said about this fight over the last 50 years, particularly over the last month or so, because it is that 50 year anniversary. And we were always intending to get into it, Matt, really, weren't we? Because this is just something that you cannot you, you cannot ignore. Yeah, it's just we were just like literally thinking, who can we get that was at the fight to, to go into to do a deep dive with? And it's you know, you're talking about that fight now, what like you say, 1971, I think it was March 8th. I mean, you don't have <laughs> who, who do we know that we can get that was there? So it's uh, we've stumbled across the perfect guest. We have indeed. We have indeed. And thanks for the correction. I think I said 8th of March, 1970. That's a good start, isn't it? When you're talking about a 50th anniversary, <laughs> a Macklin there just, just clicks into gear. You see, this is why, this is why he's the perfect man for, for, for a partner for these podcasts, just smoothly there without even really mentioning it subliminally just corrects that date in everybody's, in everybody's mind. So well played on that one. And yes, indeed, we were thinking, who can we get? Who would be the, the, the man for the job? Because you do need to have somebody who was there and, not that many people are accessible who were there because this is a link to a link to history. Uh, and we found our man. I remember reading the article in Boxing News a few weeks ago that he wrote about being ringside that night. And, you know, it's just so full of sights and sounds and smells practically, just, just vivid kind of technicolor. Uh, and it's Alan Hubbard who, who joins us this afternoon. Alan, thanks very much for doing this. Um, you've probably thought about this fight a fair bit over the last few weeks, given given the things that you've been asked to, to do about it. Do you still remember it as clearly now as you ever did? Yeah, I remember it vividly. Uh, I, mean, I was a young whip behind the ears uh, reporter who just moved into Fleet Street. I was working for a newspaper group and I had covered uh, big fights in America before. I covered Terry Downs fight and I covered uh, Joe Frazier's uh, fight with, um, uh, with, with uh, Jimmy Ellis. Uh, but this was this was something else, and I felt so privileged to be sent to cover it. And you are absolutely right; it was. It, I mean, let, let's be honest; it wasn't. It was the fight of the century. It wasn't the greatest fight of the century. Um, I think that Ali and Frazier, uh, the thriller in Manila, was a better fight. So was the uh, the rumble in the jungle. But it was the occasion more than anything else. I mean, it's, it's just incredible to think now how big it was. Um, you know, everybody, it, the world was a gog with it. Uh, they were earning two and a half million dollars each, which sounds chicken for pocket money for Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua now. But at the time, it was it was momentous. Um, and really, the whole world was just absolutely fascinated by the build up. And of course, Ali was a tremendous ticket seller, and he really built the interest in the fight. And everybody was there from sort of uh, uh, politicians downwards to the mafia, everybody, every, anybody who was anybody associated with the fight game was in Madison Square Garden that night, 18,000 people and the atmosphere, well, it really was electric. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, you took a leak next to Frank Sinatra. We'll get to we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that a bit later. But the guest, you know, the guest list at ringside was absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. So what we generally do with with these these podcasts is we'll contextualize the fight. With, with this, it's slightly different because I'm happy to assume a lot of knowledge on behalf of Macklin's take listeners. And I think I'm right to do that. You're a knowledgeable crowd. And I don't think we need to trace through in minute detail what had happened with, with Clay, who became our Lee, um, and then Frazier, because you'll be aware of it. So just painting in these kinds of broad strokes obviously they both won uh, olympic gold medals for four years apart then in terms of their entry to the pros they they were kind of similar in that they had they had syndicates behind them syndicates backing them um 
clay as he was at the time exploded onto the scene with with the victory against Sonny Liston, and then there was the conversion to to Islam, the the attachment to the to the nation of Islam, and and then he made a lot of defences from that point onwards, and then of course came the issue of the Vietnam War, and his exile for three three and a half years, uh, and during that period, Frazier took over as being the recognised active best heavyweight on the planet. He won the New York State Athletic Commission title. In '68, then the WBA and the WBC as well against against Jimmy Ellis um, in early 1970, <coughs> and so he was 26 and 0 at the time of the fight. Ali, the returning Ali, was 31 and 0. So you'd got the man in possession of the crown in action against the 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 former, still undefeated, never lost his titles in the ring, um, Ali, and it just made this incredible mixture of two undefeated fighters and both with a big big claim to be the best heavyweight on the planet and actually Alan one thing that has always really interested me about that is how come this ended up being Ali versus Frazier because boxing protocol really should it not have dictated that it should have been Frazier against Ali because he was the champion yeah well in fact um I've got the program and the uh, cap we're all issued with and it is Frazier Ali uh, on on both of those uh, pieces of uh, memento um, but of course Ali was the dominant figure there was no doubt about that because of who because of who he was um, so it, it was Ali really that people came to see and he did go into the fight as favorite despite you know those three and three nearly three and a half years of exile um, although he did have two warm-up fights, if you can call it that, against Jerry Quarry and Oscar Bonavina. But um, most people, apart from one or two uh, Ali haters like Frank Sinatra, um, thought that, um, uh, that he would win. Uh, I certainly did. Uh, I've, I'm a committed Ali file, I admit that. And I thought he would be too smart and too fast for Frazier. But that didn't prove to be the case because those, those legs weren't they, they carried him to glory but they weren't there that night it was you know he had suffered in that exile from lack of activity despite the warm-up fights and Frazier was just far was too busy for him and I couldn't dispute the result I, I agreed exactly with the referee Arthur McCanty it's sort of eight six um eight six one in uh Arlie's, in uh Frazier's favour well, that, that's a close fight, Alan. You know, 15 rounds, 8 6 1. It, you know what I mean? It's, and and, and sort Absolutely, of round. Yeah. But the and judges, some down, of the two judges, had it wider than that. Yeah. They did. They did. The other two men at ringside. Because in those days, basically, you had the referee who was a, a scoring judge, and then you had two scoring judges right. at ringside. Yeah. And RTI Dala had it 9 6. They scored it in rounds. It wasn't the point system we have now. So Frazier scored a knockdown in that, in that final round, but that was still a round win. Uh, and Bill Rex had it 11-4 to, to Frazier. Uh, you, you mentioned there that Ali was seen as the as the favourite going into the fight by many people. Did, did Was there a sense, uh, was one of the reasons why this was so big? Because it was an instance of the timing being perfect because they're both undefeated. You've got this amazing dynamic of Ali on the, on the comeback. He had managed to have a couple of of comeback fights. They'd been chasing Frazier, as I understand it, for a while. And Frazier, his team had decided that they wanted to, to make them wait, that they weren't maybe quite ready. Was, was there a sense that this was happening exactly when it needed to happen, which in boxing can be quite rare? Yes, I think there was. Um, as you say, he had a couple of comeback fights, but what brought him right back smack into the public eye was his, his first return fight with Jerry Quarry in Atlanta. Um, he was like, it was, it was like a scene from Paul G and Bess. Uh, everybody turned out and followed him like a pipe. And he was like a Pied Piper there. Uh, and the world began to love him again. They had doubts because of his stance over, or some of them did, over the Vietnam War. But um, the way he performed in his two comeback fights, he was, he was a, obviously a, a credible man to put in with Frazier. And what was the, what's really interesting I find about looking back at these fights, particularly the ones where some time has, has passed, is that often the narrative 
builds up after the fight in the wake of what actually happened. A narrative builds up around what people expected beforehand. Yeah. People rewrite history, essentially. But you were there, so you know. Uh, and you mentioned that that most people felt that Ali was was the favourite to to kind of win the fight going into the fight. But what was the yeah. what was the public perception of this fight? The way it was built up of the two characters, because I think one thing that people of our generation, mine and Matt, so we're like three four years apart in age. It's it's easy to look at Ali and think that he was always this revered, adored, worshipped, adulated, heroic figure. And that just not isn't true. That just isn't true, is it? From He was no, deeply, deeply no. unpopular in the early stages of his career. How was his popularity with the kind of US and, and global public at this uh, point? Globally, he was, uh, I would say, adored. Uh, I mean, he once said you could drop me into High Street, China, and everybody would know who I was. And that's absolutely true. Um, I, I really think that you know, the way he performed restored uh, his credibility. Uh, and uh, he'd also appeared uh, in this country on a, on a Parkinson show. And he became, he, and of course, there was a famous fight with Henry Cooper when, although he was put down, um, he still managed to woo the public with his sort of affability and geniality and uh, clowning around. Um, yes, he was, he, he was, he was extremely popular. Um, people knew him in Timbuktu and outer Mongolia, which is quite different, you know, from today when we're talking about Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua being the fight of this century, and it probably is, but as my friend Colin Hart of The Sun, who incidentally he and I, I think, are the only surviving members of the British press corps who are at the fight. As he said, uh, compared to Ali and Frazier, there's his top of the bill at your call. Yeah, it's... Do you know what, think, you know what I was going to say? I think it's, 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 it's interesting when you always compare eras and, 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 you know, you look at Anthony Joshua selling out Wembley Stadium time and time again and Cardiff and etc. But I suppose you, you look... And, and by the way, that Champions Forever video which, you know, Ali and Frazier were on, along with Foreman, Holmes and, and Kenny Norton. Like I've told you before, Andy, that's, that video, was, you can't even watch it anymore. I, I watched it that many times. So it's like, even though I wasn't obviously around in that era, it was, it was when I was getting into boxing and really falling in love with boxing, those sort of fight, fights and fighters were right up there for me. Um, but I guess in that time, in, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, if you, you know, you're an Olympic gold medalist, you're on mainstream terrestrial television in America, you know, you're in the news, you're on the back of the newspapers, you're on the TV, you're on the news. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's nobody that doesn't know you because people only have a few, you know, however many channels there were that time in America. So if you're on the TV and you're on the back of the paper, there isn't a soul in the country that doesn't know who you are, that doesn't know that fight is taking place. So, uh, you know, and, and of course, then with the, the fact that Ali's personality and his backstory of, you know, getting stripped of the title in the Vietnam War and then Frazier coming through and then they were complete, they were chalk and cheese, weren't they, in terms of characters as well, yeah. and fight and style. It couldn't have been any, it was like a perfect storm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Matt, do you think you would have been... I think I probably know the answer to this, and and, and Alan's already fessed up as being a, a, a committed Ali file. Um, would you have been Team Muhammad Ali or Team Joe Frazier heading into this fight? If you transport yourself back there, who would you have been pulling for? Well, I think, look, I mean, back when I was watching the Champions Forever video, I was definitely a Muhammad Ali fan. He was my number one guy by far. Do you know what I mean? I, I loved, what, you know, his style, his personality, his character. You know, the fact that, Whatever you believe, the fact that he stood up for what he believed, right? You know, it was just, you know, and to put himself, you know, talk's cheap, isn't it? But to really actually follow through with what you believe in, like, he, how can you not be sort of won over by someone like that? And then he had that personality, didn't he? He was funny. Just, yeah, no, I was, a, I was a massive Muhammad Ali fan, retrospectively, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, from from my side, I, I, and I'm not just saying this to be kind of contrary, that. There's so much been written about Muhammad Ali, and that's the only real access we have to the man. Um, if you if you weren't 
um, around during that era. And of course, there's an enormous amount to admire and, and all of the things that you just mentioned. There's, he was a, a truly heroic sporting figure, um, social figure uh, throughout the 20th century. There's, there's no question about that. But I think I might have been Team Frazier for this fight, Alan. And mm-hmm. the reason was because... I just don't think it was okay the way that Ali treated Frazier, the things that he said about him, the way he denigrated him and, and vilified him in the build-up to this fight. And then he could argue that they were selling tickets, but, but Frazier's counter-argument to that, I think, at one point was, well, we're both guaranteed two and a half million. We don't have to sell tickets, and this fight sells itself. I just... The, the, way, the way he treated Frazier has never, has never sat well with me. I, I think you're right, Andy. But I think that came more in fights two and three. I think you know, and he, you know, he really kind of cramped up calling him the Uncle Tom, and he really got on. You know what I mean? He was because I seen that documentary on Joe Frazier before, and I, and you know, it, it was from not that long ago, and you know, I had a lot of empathy for Frazier. I thought, oh, do you know what? Even though I love Muhammad Ali, he did probably go over the top, really. Do you know what I mean? He did. He did. He, he, he was quite. It would, would have been hard for Joe Frazier, do you know what I mean? And uh, I actually felt sorry for him and, and, and a lot of empathy thinking, yeah, no, actually seeing it from that point of view, as much as I love Muhammad Ali, he probably did go overboard. That was my opinion. I mean, Alan can, was around, he can tell us a lot more. Yeah, I think you're both absolutely right. I mean, it was, a, it, it was OTT, but the interesting thing about Ali was that, yes, he was partially selling tickets, uh, but it was also a psychological warfare. But he, he went too strong as far as Fraser and, and early Terrell was, were concerned. Uh, and that was a sort of darker side of his, of his personality. But the interesting thing about him is that I can't recall him ever denigrating in that way a white opponent. He only did it with, with, with black opponents. Um, I don't know what, the, what, what was his reasoning in that. Um, whether he wanted to keep the sort of uh, white supporters on board or what. But that, it, was, it was very interesting. I can't think of any opponent that, I mean, OK, he joshed with Henry Cooper and he joshed with Joe Bugner and George Chivalo, he called the washerwoman, but there's nothing vicious there. But he was certainly vicious in what he said about Frazier and Terrell. Yeah, it's re- it is really interesting that. It, it is really interesting. Floyd Patterson as well, foreman um, to, a, yeah. to, to a large extent. It, it's It's something that that has kind of always fascinated me that that he always seemed absolutely determined Ali to try and make sure that the 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 support of black boxing fans and and black people in society was behind him um when it came to a battle between him and a fellow a fellow black fighter and another thing that i found interesting about that too is that when you mention those other kinds of characters, you think about Patterson, you think about Frazier, you think about Foreman, and you think about the way they came up, their their backgrounds. They kind of had it a lot harder than the Muhammad Ali, uh, Cassius Clay, as he was at the time. So if anything, a lot of black people, I would imagine, would have identified more closely with their struggles when, when they were young than they would have done with, with a young Cassius Clay, I mean, there's just yeah. so many strands to this, aren't there? Which I don't know if I'm really qualified to talk about it or not, but but it, but it's kind of unavoidable that that it gets discussed. Yeah, I mean, Ali was middle class as far as sort of um, um, ethnic community was concerned, uh, and you're absolutely right. Others were blue collar, and um, Ali certainly wasn't. Um, I don't know whether he did it deliberately. Uh, whether it's all part of his psychological... Well, I think it definitely was part of his psychological warfare. And it began, of course, with Sonny Liston, the ugly bear, when he chased him through the streets. It was, it was, he was a master when it came to, um, uh, uh, to getting inside an opponent's skin. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, and I, think, I think those kind of... Uh, Matt, I've always thought those early, those early days when, when he was Cassius Clay, when he turned professional and... And he was ready to shake up the world and he was telling everybody and anybody who would listen exactly what he was going to do. And that's another kind of fight that is difficult to get a handle on, really, if you if you weren't around. But that first fight against against Liston, people thought he was completely insane. People thought he might get killed by by Sonny Liston, quite quite simply. I mean, yeah. it was it was incredible stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, T- Sonny Liston was like, you know, a scary man. We talk about the the aura and fear that Tyson had, a peak Tyson, you know, a, a young Tyson, but, you know, twenty one year old Tyson. But you know, Sonny Liston, he was he was a bad man. Do you know what I mean? Big people were genuinely scared of Sonny Liston and Muhammad Ali. Well, Cassius Clay was then didn't give to Rex, did he? He just went out there and he stuck in his face. He, he turned up at his press conference, at his training thing, and he really, really got under his skin. I mean, you know, Robert, there's obviously been re- references to a young Muhammad Ali when he was Cassius Clay, and then you know that he had the three, the over, it was over three years, the layoff, when, when they go, he had the two warm-up fights, then Jerry Quarry, um, and the other one, I can't even think of the name, I've, I've lost it, but uh, going into the Frazier fight, and it's like, it, I, you wonder, I wonder what that three and a half years in activity did to him. Were, the, were those the best years of Muhammad Ali that we never seen? Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the Ali, I think his last fight was against Zora Foley, wasn't it, before he went into exile? And I think the Ali in that fight, and, lost, and then before that, Cleveland Williams, was probably the best heavyweight we've ever seen. I think that was his zenith, that was his peak. And he, although he had some great glorious moments after that, he never achieved that, that, that degree of perfection again. If we could just go back to the Sonny Liston fight, I mean, it's quite interesting that Angelo Dundee was responsible for uh, Ali, or Clay was then, behaving the way he did. He discovered that Liston had a phobia, and that phobia was about madness. He didn't understand people who were mentally unstable. And he, that was why uh, Ali, um, at the weigh-in, behaved as he did, ranting and raving, and put shaving foam in his mouth to make it make it appear that he was foaming at the mouth. And I think, you know, Liston List, was absolutely petrified, didn't know what to do. The, the stories around those fights are, uh, are extraordinary. Of course, you know, people will be aware of what happened in the in the first fight and, and then with the phantom punch in the, in the second. There's another yeah. anecdote about... Liston and uh, and Clay, I think he was still at the time, or Ali, if it was a second fight, encountering each other in a casino, and and, and Liston slapped him hard, uh, and that gave that gave him a little bit of a little bit of pause um, for thought. So let, let's just get a little bit of of your own personal history with these two. So when was the first time that you met Ali? Um. I think it was when he came over to fight Henry Cooper. Uh, and he, it was um, a non-title fight. He wasn't champion then, of course. Uh, and uh, the fight was at Wembley. And he wore that gaudy crown. Um, it, it was a bit of a pantomime show. Uh, and, uh, oh, you know, you just, you just fell in love with the man because he was a media man. He was a media man's dream. Um, never refused an interview. Uh, always had a quote. Uh, I remember um, a few years later ringing him at, up at home in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, and I just sort of asked him how he was. Then I asked him a question about an upcoming fight, and he talked for an hour. He didn't stop in non stop for an hour. And what he said was always interesting, always funny, and, um, you know, he, you, you couldn't help but, uh, but like him. What about Frazier? When was the first time you, yeah, you came no, across which him? Yeah, that's an interesting story about. I, I, I have a claim to fame with Joe Frazier. I was the first first man to put him on the floor. It was in the Tokyo Olympics uh, when those were the days before sort of terrorism struck the Olympics and there's tremendous security when you could wander around the Olympic Village. And uh, I went into the village one day to see some British athletes and I was walking along and round the corner on a bike hurtled this young man with the biggest thighs I've ever seen pedaling furiously. I sort of ducked out of the way. He swerved and fell on the floor and grazed his knees. And I got up and I reckon he got up and I recognized him, of course, as Joe Frazier. And I thought, God, am I in trouble here? But he glowered a bit and then he sort of grinned and said, sorry, man, my mistake. How are you doing? And we shook hands and I wished him luck. And of course, he went on to win the Olympic title. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. In terms of professional boxing, uh, did you did you get up to to Philadelphia? Um, yes, and, and uh, kind of check that scene out. Yeah, I, I interviewed him when uh, at his gym in Philadelphia uh, when he was um, leading a pop group. He was a singer in a pop group, if you remember. Probably the worst singer you've ever heard. And um, he was 
you could you could still feel the simmering anger over his um, his fights with Ali. Um, and boy, it was before I think it was before he the threat in Manila, but he just he, he utterly resented Ali. He felt he'd stolen he stolen his own thunder. Okay, so let, let let's take things let's take things forward to to fight week then, because as I said, Macklin's take listeners will be aware of of a lot of the background, but it's always good to just kind of flesh things out and get a flavour of what people were actually thinking at the time. So when did you arrive then? It, this, it was on a Monday night, this fight, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. There were Monday night fights then. Uh, about a week before, we, uh, uh, a whole crew of us from the British media turned up in New York and we stayed at the uh, Statler Hilton, which was opposite Madison Square Garden. It was called the Static Hilton because every time you touch the wallpaper, you got an electric shock. Um, and of course, there was, there were, in those days, um, you had media lunches, you had individual press conferences and uh, the Madison Square Garden publicity machine was in full swing. We had a marvelously laconic PR named John Condon, uh, who I think was a model for the, all PR should be. Uh, he facilitated everything. And of course he famously issued these, um, uh, these, these, this, this cap here, uh, the red and uh, white and black, blue actually it's blue blue cat which he told us to put on our heads and of course one or two more venerable members of the British scribes objected to this he said good, good god John don't expect us to sit here wearing a baseball cap he said well guys it's up to you he said uh, if you don't wear them uh, you know you could be in trouble because there's 18,000 people in here another 5,000 trying to get in trying to break the doors down if they do and they get to the ringside the cops want to know which heads to hit and which heads not to hit that's a good line that's a good line and was the fight massively oversubscribed in yes. terms of press applications yes there were 737 i think uh, accredited journalists and 500 were turned down applications um it's the biggest turnout ever i think for uh, for a fight and Certainly, in terms of the biggest i can remember uh, and and they, you know you you read the you read the reports of of uh, it went everywhere didn't it it went absolutely everywhere all over the world broadcast yeah, everywhere yeah even Russia I mean Russia at the time uh, didn't have professional boxing but TASS sent two reporters to cover the fight. And Matt, you love New York, and we had an amazing time when we went to Madison Square Garden for that Ruiz Joshua fight because of the drama and and how it and how it turned out. But I, I don't know about you, but it is it is. It is. I do always find myself when you're around these these kinds of venues, these historic venues, imagining what it would have been like decades earlier when boxing was that much bigger. Because in, in New York, boxing was was huge, really, from the 19s, 1920s onward. Uh, and and Madison Square Garden was the perfect place. Really, you could argue at that point still the only place for a fight for a fight like this you can just kind of picture the carry on around it oh completely i mean look you know in the modern era obviously las vegas has did become a bit of a fight capital and there's some some massive fights in vegas and there's something to say about there's a you know there's something special about you're in the hotel everything's in house the, the media room there's the press conference you don't leave, you literally don't have to go outside the whole week you're, you know there's everything there's a real buzz you know, you go to the arena, you're back in the casino, they're at the bar, everyone's congregating and meeting up, and it's it's electric, and it is. But I still don't think anything beats a big fight at Madison Square Garden when the crowd, you know, spill out after onto 7th Avenue, and there's yellow taxis are everywhere, and it's sort of a bit chaotic. And, and that, that's one thing. But also, I think it's the fact that if you look down through the years of boxing history and how steeped... Madison Square Garden is. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, this era, this fight in particular, Muhammad Ali Frazier, uh, against Joe Frazier, fight of the century. But even if you look at the, the you know, Tony Zale, Rocky Graziano, Sugar Ray Robinson, Jay Lamata, he, he, you know, Madison Square Garden, as good as Vegas is, I just think for me, it's the Garden, man. Yeah, it, it was the mecca of boxing, or, or I, I think I called it the cathedral 
of clout. I mean, you, you, you felt that you were, you were in a religious place when you were in there, you know, because this is where um, boxing didn't evolve there, but it was, that, it was that, the atmosphere was hallowed. Um, it, it was a marvelous atmosphere. Uh, the only time I think it was that sort of atmosphere was capped was the, was the rumble in the jungle. I mean, that was, that was quite, quite different. I mean, it was, it was, it was in, bizarre. Nothing, nothing I think can ever equal that with a, two gladiators in the middle of the night, in the middle of the jungle, rain cascading down as soon as Ali not foreman out, sweeping away even the typewriters on the desks, rivers and, and, and kids dancing in the, in the roads that have become rivers as we drove back to Kinshasa, shouting Ali Bombaye, Ali Bombaye, and doing the Ali shuffle. Um, it's quite, Two, two different atmospheres, but Madison Square Garden will always be linked with great fights and great fighters. And this fight in particular? Yes, I think uh, people, people instantly think of Ali Frazier 1, don't they? Um, I think Ali Frazier 2 was also at the Garden, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't, uh, it was a quite a different scenario, wasn't it? Um, to say you can't repeat that sort of atmosphere. Maybe Wembley Stadium might be like that when, if and when Ali and Joshua and Fury ever do fight there. But I think it's more likely they'll fight in another, not Madison Square Garden, but another Mecca, the one in Saudi Arabia. I mean, you know, we talk about you know inboxing that that anticipation when the ring walks and everything. It. I don't think anything beats that in sport. I mean, maybe I'm biased boxing, but for me, nothing beats yeah. that patient. The fact that both these guys were undefeated just makes it even, you know what I mean? When, when someone's lost, I don't know, it's, they can, listen, I'm quite often a fighter loses and they come back a better fighter, but I would say more often than not. But in terms of hype and, and, and when both guys are undefeated, I don't think anything beats that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, as I say, I can't remember um, a more momentous occasion uh, than uh, that, that first fight at the Garden. And it, it was like being, in, um, like being in Hollywood with all the people that were there. Uh, and they weren't all sort of boxing fans. I mean, they, they were there because they wanted to be seen at the occasion. Was, was it literally the talk of the place like you know all the bars the cafes the dens. Oh, absolutely yeah absolutely i mean uh, you you couldn't get away from the fight um new york was was buzzing the whole time with talk of ali and frazier who was going to win um it just it was just a joy to be there an absolute joy I mean, we, Andy rightly said there, we did, you know, Joshua and Ruiz, the first fight at Madison Square Garden. And obviously it's the heavyweight championship of the world. It was Joshua's American debut. He's a big star. Yes, people were talking about it. People knew it was happening. But te television, media, everything nowadays is so sort of fragmented. You know, I mean, there's so many different channels on the TV that, you know, people follow what they want to follow, don't they? Where back then with it being so, you know, terrestrial TV, newspapers so mainstream with the news and this this absolutely you know um had caught that imagination hadn't it like the whole the mainstream media one million percent behind this fight pushing it big time i guess so in terms of you know the, the bars and everything else about it even the taxi drivers the, there was nobody that wouldn't have been talking about this fight i guess some fight week yeah i think you're absolutely right uh, as I say, I, I've never experienced uh, an atmosphere uh, like it. I've experienced different atmospheres in Olympic Games and other big fights, but th th this was this was something else. It really was. So, what was the week like for you then? Because this is a big assignment, and you must have been under pressure to, yeah, to produce stuff yeah. pretty much every day. I would imagine. I mean, yeah. was it was it quite regimented in terms of the press engagements, or? Or was it not? Yes, was it, it was. more it of a was, kind of free for all? It was extremely well organised with the with the with the press conferences, and you've got to remember those those are the days where you didn't have um, uh, laptops or mobile phones, and everything went by telex, uh, and so you had to sit in the press room and type out your story, then hand it to a telex operator who would send it back to London um, or or wherever your newspaper was based. 
And so what what's it like within the the kind of traveling British press pack or what was it like at, at that point? Because is it is there a team spirit there? Is everybody yeah, competing I mean, with each other? Are you trying to outdo each other or, or are you trying to help each other out? Because I've seen I've seen the inside of this in the Football World Cup and I was kind of quite surprised actually at how at how organized it it was in terms of yes. what quotes people would go with on what days and things yes, like I mean, that. I mean, you, you did you did share quotes and things, and uh, I mean, if you could get an exclusive, you would. But by and large, the boxing media were um, a quite a cordial group, we got on well with each other, uh, and um, those were the days when you, the expenses were quite generous, not like today, and um, travel was uh, travel was uh, quite enjoyable. I mean, there wasn't the security hassles that you that you have now. So, and you were very, very lucky. And someone said to me, you've got the best job in the world. And to a degree, that was true. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't like to be, let's say that I wouldn't like to be doing that job today. It's quite, quite different today. I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think it's changed quite a lot, actually, just in the, mm. in the time that I've been, in the time that I've been doing it. And, and another thing that was different, of course, is there was the heavyweight. So weighing in isn't that big a deal, but it was... Yeah. It was yeah. a same day weigh in, and yes, Ali came in at 215 pounds, Joe Frazier came in at, at 205, which is completely unthinkable for a, for a, for a massive yes. heavyweight clash these days. Well, I mean, I can tell you a story, and it's a little bit risque, but about the weigh in where we were introduced to Burt Lancaster, who was doing the um inter round summaries for the fight, the color commentator. And uh, John Condon asked us whether we'd like to meet you. And of course, he was a sort of celluloid hero of films like Trapeze and what have you, you know. And uh, he turned around and looked at us and he was wearing mascara, rouge, lipstick. And um, he said, hi, guys, don't you just love their muscles? And uh, let's say that he was a very odd character. <laughs> well, he, he, was a, he was one of a, of a huge list of, of people who were who were there at ringside, as you said earlier yeah. on, they just wanted to be involved and wanted to be around the whole thing. How did these two kind of shape up during the week for you, Ali and, and, and Frazier? I mean, how did they, how did they look? Did you ever catch them in any kind of what you might've thought were unguarded moments or were they consistent? I can't, I can't think of it. I can't think of it. I mean, they were sort of wheeled in and out of press conferences. Um, Frazier was quite, secluded i mean he kept himself to himself largely ali was different i mean if you want angelo and dundee would invite you up to ali's room and we had the separate sessions with him with, the, with just the british press which i don't think we had with frazier uh frazier was uh, it was quite quite regimented and um you, and of course the training sessions you could you could watch the training sessions uh uh, and uh, they did have a degree of, um, of a crowd there. Sometimes the public were allowed to watch him, watch them train. It's just interesting, isn't it? Fight week's always, always kind of fascinating. What, what sort of difference do you think it does make having the way in on, on the day of the fight? Because even though they don't have to make a weight, it's still something you've got to go and You've got to go and do, Matt. It's something that's going to require your attention, some nervous energy, some some psychological warfare, maybe, maybe going on there. I mean, it, it it is something that that lends a different aspect to it because I'm sure that fighters now think about you know we talk about Joshua Fury every now and again. There's no way that that Anthony Joshua would want to be facing up to Tyson Fury at the weigh in on the day of the fight because it's just. It's another thing you have to try and deal with. And that's the kind of situation Frazier was in. He's got to go and be up in Muhammad Ali's face or have Muhammad Ali up in his face just hours before the fight. It's, it's not easy. No, it's, and that's an, it's an interesting point, that is, actually, because I've never really thought about it. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, you've got Joshua and Fury, and obviously you, we, we know Fury's going to mentally, psychologically, you know, get in his head and... That, you know, that's going to be the way in and it's going to be such a big deal. Everyone's going to be there. But then you're right. Whatever happens at the way, in, you know, he gets to go away. He can unwind. He can forget about it and shut off again and doesn't have to really think about it until he's at the arena and the changing rooms. And then, you know, it's time to switch on and get his hands wrapped, etc. But, you know, going there, I'm guessing it was probably midday of the fight, the way in, you know, you've got the whole 
press, everything going. And then you've got to go away again and then try and completely switch off before coming back, you know, several hours or so later. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, as I'm talking now, I'm thinking about it. I'm just going to, I'm trying to imagine what Tyson Fury and Joshua's going to be like. And then thinking back to what Muhammad Ali must have been like that time with Joe Frazier or even what it would have been like to weigh in on the day of the fight like that. And then, you know, go back, I guess, get your head down for an hour or two if you can, or just to at least lie down and, and relax. But mm, very, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what, what, what does Alan think? I suppose a great difference today, Matt. I mean, it, it didn't matter with Ali and Frazier or any heavyweights uh, because, you know, your weight is your weight when you're a heavyweight. But now when they weigh in the day before a fight, there's that chance to put on extra weight. I think it's limited to 10 pounds, isn't it? But, you, you know, you can go away and have a good meal uh, and you can, you know, rest overnight, which you can't do on the day of the fight, of course. Mm. No, no, very, and very different for heavyweights. Like, but um, you know, for example, uh, generally most guys that are boxing weighing in, they're they they they're pretty dehydrated at the weigh-in. They yeah. then come away rehydrate, blah. But you know, you've got thirty hours or so, not only to rehydrate, get your energy back, but you can switch off. You can completely switch off and not think about the boxing until you know you get back in the arena on the night and you kind of you know switch back on. But weighing in on the day, you're meeting your opponent, you're coming face to face, the press there. You know what I mean? And then, you, then you're coming away and then, I don't know, it's what, six, seven hours before you're back in the arena. So it's, you know, it's, it's six hours compared to 30 hours. You know, it's a world of a difference, isn't it? Mm. And it must have made for quite a, quite, quite a busy day um, for you, for, for, for yourself work-wise, because you will need to report on the, on the way in and what, what went on there. And then you haven't got too much time before the fight itself no. starts. And um, I mean, another really interesting thing about this, there's just little details about this fight that, that fascinate me is the fact that Arthur McCante, the referee, he ended up getting the call to do this fight about mid afternoon. He got the call at work saying, you know, from the New York State Athletic Commission saying, you need to get yourself to the garden tonight. And it was only at that point that he realized that he knew that obviously he was in the running for the, for the main, for the main fight. So just, just, just set the scene for us, just paint us a picture of, of what, what Madison Square Garden was was like that night, and was obviously there was an undercard, um, but I guess everybody was just waiting for the main event. Yeah, I mean, uh, people were in the bars. I mean, you could get a drink then, you know. And uh, it, 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 well, the atmosphere was throbbing, throbbing with anticipation. Right. Um, well, uh, you had to fight. Your, you had to fight to get in because the crowd. Um, John Condon reckon there were five thousand outside. I reckon there were more than that trying to get in. Um, and I mean, the place was packed to, was packed to capacity, uh, like any fight night, really, when there's, a, when there's a really big fight on. But this was, this was more than that. You know, you, you, uh, you knew that you were here for a great occasion. Um, and it, it was quite hot, as I recall, in there as well. Um, and uh, I can't remember much about the undercard, to be honest, because we're all, you know, it, it, all intent <clears throat> on the on the big fight and waiting waiting for it to happen um i, I can't recall uh, too much about the ring walks either because uh, you know they were sort of um walking through the crowd as it were to, to get into the ring uh, but once they were there i just remember a mighty roar going up as they re were respectively introduced but it was I'll just reel off some of the names of people who were at ringside. You mentioned Burt Lancaster. He'd somehow managed to get himself a, a commentary gig. Um, I, I could just imagine uh, the likes of uh, uh, Matt exploding at the idea that his, his punditry role might be taken by an actor for, uh, for a massive <laughs> fight like that. Um, Frank Sinatra, who you bumped into in the gents, Michael K. Yeah. Miles Davis, Diana Ross, Dustin Hoffman, Barbara Streisand, Sammy Davis, Gene Kelly, the Apollo 14 astronauts. There were all sorts of people, all sorts of people. Um, James Taylor apparently got, got given 30 tickets or yeah, 15 pairs of tickets because he was supposed to have the garden that night. He booked it for, uh, he was performing that night and, and they had to, they knew that they had to move him because this was the only date they could, they could really do. But Sinatra was was running around at ringside taking photos, wasn't he? He managed yeah, to get was, himself accredited by Life magazine. Life magazine, yes, he was. I mean, I, I, I did see some of the photographs and they weren't bad. 
but he but I, I think it was just an excuse to, to to get him there a bit of a gimmick really i'll tell you something interesting about the post-fight press conference uh and uh, you mentioned diana ross uh well when we walked into the post-fight press conference which was very well organized diana ross was sitting in the front row of the media seats and john condon came in he looked down and uh he looked at her and he said uh, who are you with little lady and she said i'm diana ross and he said i didn't i know who you are he said i asked who are you with which media she said no no i'm i'm just here i'm diana ross and he said sorry little lady media only out <laughs> out she had to trot <laughs> holy shit that's amazing like that, that that's like um just trying to think of what would be the that's beyonce like, that's right beyonce yeah that's like sleeve yeah, right, beyonce right. out can you, can you imagine any a british pr getting rid of being sent out little lady to beyonce <laughs> It's an entertaining image, though, isn't it? We know Dan yeah. Matry well. Dan Barnard, very nice chap. Very, very good at his job, but very nice, calm man. I'd, yeah, yeah. God, that would be a sight to behold him, chucking Beyonce out of a press conference. Yeah, yeah I can't picture that. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, terms, in terms of the fight, it's, the fight itself, um, the fact that they weighed what they weighed, Matt, had, had a big bearing on it. 215 for Ali, 205 for Frazier. That wasn't unusual, really, for, for, for heavyweights around that kind of time. We'd had some big men, of course, in the likes of Lister was was a big guy and then Foreman, um, who came later on, was 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 huge. But they weren't the size of fighter that they are now. And what, what it meant was that you got 15 rounds where there wasn't really any point at the fight and I watched it again yesterday, where you could say that anyone was really taking a round off. Both of them were always trying to win every every round, almost at full throttle, really. And to do that for 15 rounds in heavyweight boxing, that is just not something you see anymore. I mean, I mean nowadays, you know, there's so much more um, accessibility to nutrition and, and, and strength and conditioning, and everything's moved on and improved. Of course they have. But you look back in those days and they would go 15 rounds, bell to bell, big men. You know, that's it was a hot pace. You know, I remember my seeing, I mean, obviously, you know, I wasn't at the fight, but I've watched the fight back on tape. And, you know, you see Muhammad Ali coming out in that first round. And I think, you're thinking, fucking hell, this is a fast pace. They're going to go 15 rounds like this. And they did. You know what I mean? They did go 15 rounds like that. Yeah, there'd have been times when the pace slowed a bit, of course. And he was on the ropes, Ali. He was very good at pacing it and getting a rest and trying to get work out of Frazier. But, you know, Frazier digging in body shots. You think to yourselves, I, I, I mean, I think this a lot. When I, when I, whenever I watch that fight, I think it, because they always show the clip with a knockdown. Even when it's just a highlight piece, he gets hit in the 15th round. After 15 rounds at that pace, with those shots going in, the body shots, to get hit then, bang on the chin, left hook, going down that heavy. And literally got straight up on his feet. You think, fucking hell, he must have had some chin on him. Do you know what I mean? And and yeah, great great neck chin. and a great chin. You're absolutely right. Um, what is interesting, of course, when they fought the Thriller in Manila, when they were both older and heavier, the pace was even more frenetic than it was at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, they, that, that... Know, there, were, there were more punches thrown in that fight than there were at, uh, in, in Ali Frazier 1. Yeah, I think the Thriller in Manila was probably a more brutal fight. But yes. I think the fact that Ali and Frazier were probably in their peak in the first one, where they're a little bit past it for the Thriller of Manila, I think that's why people think that's the fight of the century. And just the build-up, they're both undefeated, the, the politics around yeah. it and everything else. Yeah. I mean, did, did you get the sense when you were watching it, Alan, that we talked before about how the timing of the fight for once in, in boxing was probably perfect and they're both undefeated. And yes, Ali's coming back off this three year layoff. He's had a couple of fights back, but you're not really sure what he's going to be like at that kind of level. And then they both really did deliver. Did you get the sense that this was as good as it had maybe ever been for, for a world heavyweight title fight? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> old as I am, I can't go back to the days of Dempsey and Lewis, unfortunately. Um, it was certainly as good as I've, as I've ever seen until later when we saw the, the thriller in Manila and the rumble in the jungle. Um, I regretted very much that Ali had been out for so long because I, I honestly think, uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm a bit of an Ali fan, but I really do think that had... He had the fight taken place uh, without that 
uh, his absence from the ring, that Ali would have won. Yeah, I mean, Alan, it's fair. I think it's, I think it's fair to assume that probably those that three and a half year layup, that, that they would have been his best years, wouldn't they? Absolutely, as I said before, you know that uh, that last fight with Zora Folly uh, was was simply breathtaking. It, it, it wasn't. I mean, Folly was an old man. That's true. But it just it just Ali's technique, his speed, uh, his sublime skill. Um, you, I, I mean. I'm, I, it was probably the best boxing exhibition uh, by a heavyweight ever um, and probably the most skillful since uh, the welterweight days of Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah, it's, it's mad when you think that we've probably never seen the best of him because of that layoff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we did see the best of him uh, in, in his, in, in his uh, last fight, in last two fights. Uh, but I'd like to have seen the best of him against Frazier. So was was the feeling amongst the press as the fight was unfolding that that Frazier had had taken a lead and that he'd that he'd held it to the end of the fight when when the bell went at the end of that fifteenth round? Were yeah, you I quite, don't think were you any, fairly confident you knew what was coming? I don't think there was much doubt uh, among any of us that um, that Frazier had won. Um, it is just by by how much varying degrees of of, of the points. Um, the fight itself, you know, unfolded, as you say, not dramatically, but interestingly. Um, and I think, as you said earlier, Frazier just edged it most of the time, although Ali did win a few rounds. Um, and in my book, he won, and the referees, he won, he won six rounds and there was one even. I don't know which one was even. I can't remember that. Um, but I, it was a fair result. You couldn't argue with the result. Did he break his jaw in that fight? Sorry? Did Muhammad, did Muhammad Ali break his jaw in that fight? His own, did Frazier break his jaw? Ali's jaw? Uh, yes, it was, it was, it was, it was fractured. I don't, think it was, it, I don't think it was as bad a break as he had when he fought Ken Norton. Um, but he actually, uh, he actually uh, went to hospital afterwards, and so did Frazier. But Frazier stayed in hospital. Ali Ali came out sort of over after staying in overnight. But Frazier stayed in hospital for several weeks. Yeah, but I remember I remember seeing an interview with him immediate, you know, a couple of hours, an hour or whatever after the press conference. Very badly he, swollen, very badly yeah, swollen jaw, massively yeah. swollen jaw. A great left hook, but he was always susceptible to a left hook. Ali, if you remember, Henry put him down with a with a great shot like that. So what was the reaction? What was the reaction from the kind of wider sporting public as, as well as people within boxing when Frazier got the win? Um, I, I think they, it was accepted. I think people realised that it was a, a good fight, but there was, an, there was an understanding that Ali wasn't at his best. And uh, yeah, people just wished that he had been. It would have been an even better fight. Did people, was there a feeling that, did Joe Frazier feel like he wasn't getting his due respect because people were saying, I'd imagine Joe Frazier would be thinking, wait there, you're all picking Ali to beat me and now, now I've beaten him, you're saying he wasn't at his best. Was there a bit of that? Yeah, um, yeah I think there was, but he did, I mean, he did, um, he was still gloating about it um, uh, afterwards, even after the thriller in Manila. He said, well, you know, at least I, at least I beat him the first time. It was interesting as well. Well, the whole the whole dynamic between the two from the from the very beginning went went through a number of kind of different different phases. But after that first fight, it seemed inevitable, didn't it? Really, that they would fight again. But it actually took quite a long time to happen. Uh, and yeah. then when it did happen, that second fight was fairly underwhelming, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, I mean, I wasn't there. I was covering the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand when that took place. Uh, but I've seen the fight on on film, and as you say, it wasn't it it, it was by no means an epic. Uh, Ali won it and won it fairly comfortably, I thought. Um, but then you know, it, we just long. Uh, there had to be a third meeting because it's one all, even though the second fight was uh, was a non-title fight. Um, there had to be a third fight, and by God, what what a fight that was! Absolutely, that that's that's very much worthy of uh, of an episode of its of its own at uh, at some point. When you were there, was it was it the kind of occasion 
did you know that this was going to really stand the test of time uh, and that it was one of those sporting events that for those who were present, it, you would forever be able to say, I was there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, no doubt about that. I mean, you knew, you knew that before the fight itself, that you were going to you were going to sit, you were going to be part of uh, one of the uh, greatest occasions in sporting history. Um, but Alan, you, you, when that happens and you get that, that level of hope and that level of anticipation, you know, it's rare that the fight then, it, not impossible, not, it, it does happen, but it's rare that the fight then lives up to those expectations, to, to, to lives up to that anticipation, that level of interest. This fight did do that, didn't it? It did. It did, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're right, of course. I mean, so, so many of these uh, so-called... Um, uh, marquee fights are, are a bit of a letdown, uh, but this certainly wasn't. I'd, I'd, I wish I could see it all over again, actually. Um, perhaps not when, it, not I mean, I've seen it on, on film, of course, but I'd, I'd like to see that fight again uh, when I'm feeling a bit more relaxed and not as tense as I was at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can add that aspect, can't it? Work, working on things. I've managed yeah. to kind of just settle in and and enjoy everything now, but definitely, yeah. definitely earlier in my career, there's not that kind of feeling that you just want it to be over and for it to have gone well. Although at times it can be, uh, it could be a bit, it could be a bit like that. I mean, how, how did you? I mean, there were some massive big hitters there from the from the American press. I think Norman Mailer was there. Um, yeah. Bud Smith, yeah, yeah, Bud Bud Schulberg, I think was there. Yep. Um, yeah. What was it like mixing with characters like that? Because these, these for me, as, as a kind of student of boxing history and, and an avid reader of boxing writing, these are kind of mythical characters. Almost. Well, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I can't remember how old I was, but I was quite young. I was in my early 20s. And um, I, I was overawed, completely overawed to be, uh, as I say, it's a, going to the gents uh, for a quick pee and standing next to Frank Sinatra, who looks around and says, how are you doing, fella? Oh, fine, Mr. Sinatra, you know, who do you fancy? I said, well, Arlie, nah, no chance. He said, Fraser will destroy him. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to, to imagine kind of arguing with the chairman of the board about, about, yeah, about yeah. anything, to be honest with you, <laughs> um, about anything, about anything at all. So just, just, just a few more minutes and, 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 we'll, and we'll wrap up. It's, you've surveyed that heavyweight scene for the last, for the last 50 years and... As we said, a lot changes and, and the media becomes more fragmented and, and coverage becomes more splintered and, and never more so than now. Terrestrial TV, in this country at least, hasn't been that interested in boxing for for a while. And so that kind of terrestrial TV fame that, that people used to have doesn't really exist anymore. You'd probably say that the last person to really achieve that mind-boggling kind of everybody who walks past him in the street knows who he is fame as a boxer was probably Barry McGuigan. Um, it's a different country, world. Yeah. yeah, in this country, yeah. It, uh, yes, not, not a heavyweight, as you say. Nassim Hamed, maybe? I don't know. Different, different character to McGuigan. Um, heavyweights, Lennox Lewis. Um, and now, of course, you, uh, I, would, I would say Joshua and Fury. Yeah. So, just before we let you go, let's... Um, what 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 do you assuming that that happens? What do you what do you expect to see uh, between those two? I I think it will be a decent fight for five or six rounds, uh, but I I think Fury might knock him out, um, and I tell you why because that performance that Fury gave against Deontay Wilder was a different Fury, and if he repeats that against Joshua. I mean, Joshua hasn't got the greatest defense in the world. And if, if he couldn't knock out Andy Ruiz in the second fight, I don't think he can knock out Fury, uh, who is a fast mover for, the, for a man of his size. But I think it will be a, a pretty intense fight for five or six rounds. But if pushed, I would pick Fury to win it by a stoppage. Do you, th do you think that it, uh, as I said, for the, for the reasons I kind of just outlined, it's not going to capture the, the, the attention of the world in the way that the fight of the century did, in the way that fights used to. But do you think that this one could really, certainly in the UK, this could really, this could really be on a scale that we 
that we've not seen for a long time because it's two absolutely. British it's two British heavyweights going for the for the undisputed yeah, crown. Ab- absolutely right, Andy. It will it will do wherever it takes place. My only fear is that it will be delayed and that people will start to lose a little bit of interest. I mean, they're now talking about possibly December fighting. Well, if de- December comes and goes and we've still got COVID, it's going to be next year. And uh, neither of them are getting any younger. Um, I, I think they somehow or another, I know they need a crowd, but they've got to get it on and try and get it on this year by the summer. Absolutely, absolutely. We're we're I mean we're waiting with with bated breath for for news of that fight, for news of all sorts yeah. of things at the minute. The um the clock is ticking and announcements are different at the minute. Uh, they have been for the last for the last year, obviously, and and things are just they're not announced. Information is not released in the same way that it that it that it used to be. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's a that's a discussion for another time. So we'll we'll wind it up there. Alan, th- thanks very much for um. For doing this um and for uh you won't have noticed during the course of the of the podcast but he had to recruit some some technical help and uh and uh get the laptop fired back up again uh which was again which was which was greatly appreciated yeah it's just great to talk to somebody who was who was you always need somebody who was who was there because it, it doesn't matter how knowledgeable a boxing historian is and how much they've and how much they've read and how much opinion they've kind of canvas there is never any substitute for somebody who actually walked walked the walk and when you think about this career and and, and what it what it entails you need some you need you need some luck don't you in 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 what coincides with your with your beat and that was you know that was that was a stroke of i mean i've i've been lucky lucky enough to go around the world mainly with muhammad ali and not just boxing i mean i've covered a dozen Olympics or so, and a couple of World Cups, and well, more than a couple of World World Football Cups, and I've been very, very fortunate. But the trouble is, um, as I say, it's very different these days. I wouldn't like to be doing it, but you too do tend to get a bit blasé. Um, I'll just tell you very quickly a story. Anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, I was at my my parents' home, and uh, I was tra- with my usual travelling companion, Colin Hart. And uh, we made our booking to travel to Kingston, Jamaica. I rang the travel agent and he said, I've got bad news for you. He said, I can't get you a direct flight to Kingston. Once you go bay, change plays and wait around for three hours. And I turned to Colin and I said, I've got to wait around for three hours in Monte go bay. And later my father said, you know, there are people in this world who give their right arm to sit around in Monte go bay for three hours. Yeah, I'd say he's right. I'd say he's absolutely right, one hundred percent. Okay, well, we'll wind it up there. Uh, thanks, thanks very much once again, Alan. And then maybe we'll get you back on in future to talk about that that third fight between the two, the Thriller and the Manila, yeah, because that was an, an yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable occasion. Uh, Matt, thanks as always, and thanks to everybody for for tuning in. If you haven't got over to the YouTube channel that we set up a couple of months ago yet, then then please do. There's plenty of good stuff over there. As for this one, the audio podcast that comes out on a Tuesday, this goes up on YouTube on a Thursday. Uh, We will be back again soon.